Chapters 17 and 18 of the Apocalypse make striking prophecies about the great harlot or whore of Babylon, which will arise in the last days from the city of seven hills. Rome was constructed on seven hills. This is why throughout history Rome has been identified as the city of seven hills mentioned in the Apocalypse. The Vatican sits within the city of Rome. In order to escape the conclusion that the Vatican is involved in the prophecies about the great harlot who sits on seven hills, some have made the ridiculous argument that the city of seven hills has nothing to do with the Vatican. They say this because the Vatican is a separate legal country as of 1929. The Vatican is the smallest country in the world, encompassing only 110 acres of land and the seven hills of Rome are not located within the 110 acres which make up the Vatican. This is an absurd argument because the Vatican, while now a sovereign country, is located within Rome. Moreover, according to this argument, it would mean the past popes, the bishops of Rome, did not reign from Rome because they were in the Vatican. It is further obliterated by the quote from Pope Benedict XIV, he speaks of Babylon, the city of seven hills, which was known to be Rome. He says, quote, The greatest worldly power bows down in awe before religion, and how what was once the earthly Babylon has been transformed into a new heavenly city. He is clearly speaking of the location of the true church, and he says that the city of Rome has been transformed into the heavenly city of the true church of Christ. This could only be true if the Vatican is synonymous with Rome and its seven hills. And Benedict XVI also confirms that Rome is Babylon. Benedict XVI homily, June 29, 2009, quote, There are also two other letters under the name of St. Peter. The first ends with an explicit greeting from Rome, which, however, appears under the apocalyptic pseudonym of Babylon. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. 1 Peter 5.13 Based on this information, Protestants throughout the centuries have accused the Catholic Church of being the whore of Babylon. But the Protestants are wrong, of course, because the Catholic Church is the Immaculate Bride of Christ, the one true church he founded. What the whore of Babylon describes, however, is a counterfeit bride, a counter-Catholic church which arises in the last days in order to deceive Catholics, the true faithful, and to tread upon the faith and commit spiritual fornication. Apocalypse 17 verse 4 states that the whore of Babylon is clothed round about in purple and scarlet and holds a golden cup in her hand. This is perhaps one of the most revealing verses in the Apocalypse. In the Catholic Church, bishops wear purple and cardinals wear scarlet. By choosing to describe the whore of Babylon as a woman clothed in purple and scarlet, God is giving us a clear indication that the whore is clothed in the colors of true bishops and cardinals. God is giving us a clear indication that the whore is clothed in these colors because externally she gives all the appearances of being the true church of Christ. She has diocese, a hierarchy, the property of the church, vestments, ceremonies, quote, sacraments, a quote, pope, etc. But inwardly she is a fraud. This is a perfect description of the Church of the Vatican II sect, the end-time counter-church which is clothed with the colors of Catholicism and appears to most to be just that, but inwardly is a false apostate religion. Priests offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass in the Catholic Church are required to use a chalice of gold if possible. It is no coincidence that the whore has a golden cup in her hand. The whore, as usual, is mimicking, acting, and pretending to be the Catholic Church, but she is not. A Catholic priest offers the golden chalice full of the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The whore offers the chalice or cup full of abomination and filthiness, the invalid wine of the new mass. The Apocalypse says numerous times that the whore of Babylon made all nations to drink of the wine of her fornication. In other words, it speaks of spiritual fornication having to do with wine. The invalidating changes which were made to the new mass are changes which were made in the wine portion of the words of consecration. 
The Apocalypse says that the whore of Babylon is characterized by fornication and whoredom. It is simply a fact that when the term fornication is used in Holy Scripture, many times it describes idolatry and spiritual infidelity. Exodus 34.16, quote, They make thy sons also to commit fornication with their gods. Judges 2.17, quote, Committing fornication with strange gods and adoring them. Many other passages could be given to show that Scripture describes spiritual infidelity and idolatry as fornication, whoredom, and harlotry. When a, quote, great harlot committing worldwide fornication is spoken of in this context, it clearly indicates apostasy from the one true faith. As we have already proven apostasy from the one true faith and an acceptance of false religions is exactly what most characterizes the Vatican II counter-church and the Vatican II apostasy. It has put the demonic, quote, gods of the pantheon of world religions on a par with the true god of the Catholic Church. This fornication, which begins from apostate Rome and its antipopes, has been spread and imbibed all over the earth as we have shown. In Apocalypse 18, verse 23, it states that the light of the lamp shall no longer shine in the whore of Babylon. The light of the lamp is a reference to the sanctuary lamp found in Catholic churches. This lamp signifies Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. This lamp can hardly be found in the Vatican II churches. In most cases, it has been moved to the side or to the back of the church. But more than the displacement of the sanctuary lamp, Apocalypse 18.23 is indicating that Christ's real presence, the valid Eucharist, is no longer found in the Vatican II Church. Apocalypse 18 verse 23 also states that the voice of the bridegroom shall no longer be heard in the whore of Babylon. This means that the teaching or voice of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and of the bride, his church, will no longer be heard in this false church. In Apocalypse 17 and 18, it states that the whore is drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs. The whore can be said to be drunk with the blood of the saints on many levels. The first that comes to mind is ecumenism as it is practiced by the Vatican II sect. Prior to Vatican II, ecumenism referred to the apostolic endeavor to convert the world to Catholicism. Today it refers to the effort to bring all religions together as one without conversion while respecting all religions as essentially equal. Ecumenism goes directly against the divinely revealed truth that the gods of the non-Catholic religions are devils, Psalm 95.5, 1 Corinthians 10.20, and it puts Christ on a level with Lucifer. Thus it blasphemes the memory of the saints and martyrs, whose flesh was torn with iron hooks, bodies were fed to the lions, and heads were chopped off because they refused to compromise their faith one iota, or say that all religions are true or equal. It also mocks all the sacrifices of all the saints who gave up their lives for the priesthood, for religious life, for missionary work. All of it was unnecessary according to the Vatican II sect. Because Margaret Clitheroe refused to accept the Anglican sect and its quote mass, but rather invited Catholic priests into her home against the penal laws, she was martyred by being crushed to death under a large door loaded with heavy weights. She suffered it all because she wouldn't accept Anglicanism. The Vatican II sect, however, teaches that Anglicans are fellow Christians who don't need conversion. The Vatican II sect teaches that her martyrdom was pointless. It is thus drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. How many martyrs gave their lives for one article of the Catholic faith? Ecumenism renders their blood-shedding acts worthless, pointless, and meaningless. This is why the Vatican II Church is said to be drunk with the blood of the martyrs and of the saints, and all those who support this Antichrist activity now headed by Benedict XVI are drunk as well. Apocalypse 6 verse 9, quote, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and revenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? It is prescribed that Catholic Mass is set on altars which contain the relics of martyrs. Thus, it makes perfect sense that the martyrs, 
whose lives are being mocked by the Vatican II sect's ecumenism and endorsement of false religions, are crying out from under the altar. They are crying out not only at the interreligious ecumenism which mocks their lives, but also at the liturgical abominations which occur directly over their relics in the new Mass. This striking point from Scripture should also show Protestants that the Catholic Church is the one true Church. And contrary to what the Protestants believe, the fact that ecclesiastical Rome's apostasy from the Catholic faith in the last days is predicted in Scripture proves rather than disproves the authenticity of the Catholic Church. For the tribulation of the last days will be one which focuses on deceiving the true faithful and undermining the true faith.